This is BBC News, the headlines. The head of the Afghan army has been sacked following a rapid offensive by the Taliban, who've taken over nine provincial capitals. Tens of thousands of civilians have fled their homes and hundreds have died in recent weeks. President Ashraf Ghani has been rallying beleaguered troops in Mazar-e-Sharif, a crucial northern city under pressure from the offensive. It's long been a bastion of anti-Taliban militias. New charges have been filed against the prominent Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny, who's already serving time in prison. The authorities claim his anti-corruption foundation infringes on people's rights. It investigates corruption among the Russian elite. Italy may have registered the hottest temperature ever recorded in Europe, a reading in Sicily registered 48.8 degrees Celsius. Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. With me are the Conservative commentator Tim Montgomery and Sienna Rogers, who is the editor of Labour List. Well, let's take a look at tomorrow's front pages, starting with the Metro. And it leads with the title Return to the Dark Ages, as Taliban forces continue to make rapid advances, seizing territories from Afghan government forces. On the front page of the Mail, the British man working as a security guard at the British Embassy in Berlin arrested on suspicion of passing classified documents to Russia. The Telegraph also leads on this story. It says that the arrest has prompted calls for an urgent review of the government's use of private contractors. A government investigation into the state of children's services during the pandemic shows councils dealing with a sharp rise in social services referrals and soaring costs for mental health support. The Eye says that the government is planning to use water air purifiers and ultraviolet light to keep schools safe from COVID. 30 primary schools in Bradford will take part in the pilot. The Times has more on the US lawsuit against Prince Andrew. The paper says that Prince Charles fears the case could end up lasting at least two years, overshadowing the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and that he sees no way back to public life for the Duke of York. And in the Financial Times, the US government calls on oil cartel OPEC to increase oil production in an effort to curb high petrol prices and that officials say could harm the global recovery. Tonight at 10, the humanitarian OK, well, let's start. And let's start with that very stark headline uh, on the front page of the Metro. Uh, Tim Montgomery. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about the Taliban offensive. We'll, we've been talking about the politics behind this story. But the Metro story is very much about the human Good cost, the about the advanced. civilians' fear as the Taliban takes more and more ground. It's uh, heartbreaking, isn't it, Rita, just so reading Kabul, this story? You know, we can get Our um, correspondent, Yogi Dalimai, is numbers in Kabul, in a city crammed with thousands of people who've desperately uh, fled uh, from other parts of the country. Injured in the last month alone, 1,000 Afghans killed nine provincial uh, towns and cities falling to Taliban control. But the number on the front page of the Metro tomorrow that I would, uh, that will haunt me and haunt probably many people who read it is 12. And that's the age of young girls that the Taliban are taking prisoners and turning into sex slaves, the age of 12. We said to the Afghan people, as Britain, America, NATO, the Western world, that this time would be different. We would stand with them to ensure the Taliban never came back. And I'm afraid we have broken that promise. And I think it's a tragedy for the people involved in a, on an unimaginable scale. But it's also a tragedy for the West. Can the West be trusted anymore to stick with our allies, to stick by our promises? And I'm beginning to fear a lot of people in the world, the conclusion to their, the answer to that question for them is going to be no. Sienna, what do you think? Is this the West, the US, NATO, Britain effectively abandoning Afghanistan or is it a piece of political realism that after 20 years uh, there has to be a withdrawal? 
Well, I, I tend towards the view that there had to be a withdrawal and that I understand why Joe Biden has, has made this decision. But I think also, you know, as Tim has highlighted, I would also draw attention to the fact that the, the main kind of bit of this story that is really heartbreaking are these girls being raped, taken as sex slaved, sex slaves, and it's um, it's horrible to read about. And I think, you know, Amnesty and other organizations, they were very critical, actually, of the way that um, victims of violence, women, girls, weren't represented in the kind of in the peace talks leading up to this withdrawal. And I think that's something that needs to be part of the conversation, just to have a, a bit more kind of nuance in this conversation. And I was also, I mean, I think a lot of this reflects on just how, you know, there are lots of questions about what the Western forces have actually been doing there these past 20 years. I mean, I was just reading a BBC report from a Taliban court session that was saying that the people there, they feared the new kind of punishments that would be imposed um, by the Taliban, but they were saying, well, at least the government corruption is on its way out. Because there was that such a horrific extent of government corruption that cases would take just so long and that it was all about kind of, you know, their payoffs, basically. And, you know, the, that corruption from the Afghan government was also on display during COVID as well. I mean, it, you know, there was completely unequal allocation of resources to people during the pandemic. So, you know, army generals from the US have said that they had no idea what they were doing over the last 20 years. And, you know, Bush, Obama, Trump, they all failed. So it's completely understandable that Biden would decide to, to withdraw. But the way that this was done, perhaps there were, there were there's more discussion to be had about that. And I mean, the two of you are diametrically opposed on this because Tim was just shaking his head as you were speaking. So I'm just going to let Tim come back in there. Look, look, what Sienna has said about the corruption of the Afghan government is true. You know, this is not the kind of democratic standards we have in Western European nations. But over the last 20 years, yes, we haven't turned it into, uh, you know, Britain, you know, equivalent in the Middle East. But girls have been educated in their millions. Uh, it's largely a country where uh, people don't have to fear for their basic security uh, compared to the past. It was huge advances compared to what existed before. And the, the, the median age in Afghanistan is only 18, 19. These people don't have never known the Taliban. And we are now allowing their country to fall under, uh, under Taliban control. I, I have little patience, I'm afraid, with people who say we didn't achieve anything while we were there. We achieved an awful lot. We didn't achieve perfection, but we're now throwing it away. Uh, I'm just going to get Sienna to reply to that. Um, we didn't achieve anything, but maybe we didn't any achieve anything lasting. Well, this is the point. I wouldn't say that we didn't achieve anything. Certainly not. I completely recognise that violence against women and girls was trying to be addressed. Absolutely. And the fact that there was progress made on that is, is really encouraging and heartening. But ultimately, what's the alternative? Are we just going to stay there indefinitely? Uh, to me, kind of a common sense approach would say that that's wrong um, and that the changes we need to make need to be more lasting than immediately, you know, cities being Taliban as soon as the withdrawal happens. I mean, that is a damning indictment. OK, let's move on. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about that story uh, for, for many weeks to come. Uh, let's go to um, the front page of the mirror, although this story is actually on several front pages. Russia spy sold secrets. Uh, you can see that there. And I also want to take you to the front page of The Times, uh, which has uh, the same story. Fears that UK embassy spy sold terror intelligence to Russia, straight out of John le Carre, Tim. It really is. And um, I was very fortunate. I'm of a certain age, Rita, where um, I was able to go and visit Berlin when it was still divided between East and West. And it's always had that sort of, as you say, John le Carre feel uh, to me. And we don't know the individual specifics of this story, how much highly sensitive material this David S. character might have given away. It seems to be largely about British counter uh, terrorism intelligence. But what I think it underlines really is how much 
uh, Germany is in the front line still of the battle to contain Russia. I'm talking to you tonight from Salzburg, a place, of course, which was attacked by the Novichok um, poisoning. You know, Russia is always on the offensive against and um, it's just very fortunate that uh, we seem to have foiled this latest attempt by Russia to uh, to spy on us and to uh, and and to harm us. Mm. Uh, Sienna, a sort of a story that interests you. Are you intrigued by it? I am. I mean, there's some interesting details in the, in the Times write up. It says, you know, that sources suggest that his motivation was was money rather than ideological links. Um, obviously, I think, you know, Tim was saying we, we don't quite know what kind of information he might have been able to, to pass on, which is certainly the case. I think probably, the, you know, the British will try and, and play down what he was able to pass on if, if there was anything particularly sensitive. I think there were sensitive documents. Um, I mean, the things kind of like security protocols at the embassy those are the kind of things that are actually very useful you know even things like the wi-fi network you know what the passwords are what the you know the timetable are of staff um you know perhaps even names of you know mi6 officers who are stationed there in berlin it, it would be interesting to find out a little bit more about the kind of information that he could have passed on I don't know whether we will ever find that out, but that would be interesting. Yes, absolutely. Um, Tim, can I take you to another story on the front page of The Times? Uh, this is about uh, costly COVID tests for travellers. The Times is saying that the watchdog has failed to act. Um, in, in what way? Yes, well, you know, I, I've decided not to try and go abroad this summer. It just the thought, you know, the prospect of quarantine and rules changes have sort of scared me off this year. Um, but another thing that has sort of scared me off is these, you know, high costs of COVID tests. And um, there seems to be the estimate that they really should only be costing about 30, 35 pounds. But many um, firms, as travellers will be all too aware of, are charging twice, three times, four times, multiple times as much as the as the justifiable cost. Huge profits are being made. That's bad for travellers who may not just be going to a beat, but to reconnect with family abroad that they haven't seen during the pandemic. But it's also bad for you know the the travel industry. It employs a lot of people in the UK. It's important to a lot of people's livelihoods. And these extra costs being piled on at uh, those families and that industry, you know, threatens a lot of jobs. So it's a serious issue. And the authorities, according to The Times, haven't really served us very well in getting those costs under control. And Sienna, there's some interesting detail in this in this uh, report. Um, there have been complaints over those refusing to give refunds despite failing to deliver results on time. So you pay hundreds of pounds and you don't get the results. Well, exactly. I mean, there's been all these reports of people, just loads of thousands of people failing to be properly tested. And there are there have been these photos posted online of boxes, you know, um, of uh, Randox. This is the, the firm that's quoted in this story as well, um, just overflowing with unprocessed swabs. Um, testing companies clearly not coping with the demand. And there has been anger at the government for basically allowing a, a scam to happen, a kind of enforced scam, because you have to get these PCR tests done. And obviously there's, you know, there's 20% VAT on all of these tests. And some of them have been going for even like £500 or more. I mean, most of them are not in that range. But other countries, I mean, France, there's no cost at all for those kind of PCR tests when you're doing international travel. Greece and Italy have capped prices. So obviously, that's what people are kind of expecting uh, from Sajid Javid, really some, some action. But it, it seems as if um, the Competition and Markets Authority is not going to look at this until after the summer break. So, yeah, I mean, like Tim, I've completely given up on the idea of actually going away this summer. I'm definitely going to be staycationing. Yes, probably gives you a certainty, a sort of peace of mind, I'm sure. Um, Tim, can I take you to um, the front page of The Guardian? Uh, and, uh, you know, you're not travelling abroad, and I think people might think twice of going to Italy with uh, reports of extreme temperatures of a potential record temperature in Sicily. Well, I'm, I'm a really boring Englishman. Not only am I not travelling abroad, if the temperature gets much higher than 25 degrees centigrade, I start grumbling. I'm always glad when the weather forecast says that hot periods are coming to an end. 
Um, but you know, on a serious level, this this level of temperature, I think even for people who like heat, is un, unbearable. And it's just you know the latest illustration that something really is happening to our climate. And um, I am probably uh, less optimistic uh, than Sienna about the possibility of Western governments and Western populations, more particularly, making the necessary sacrifices to combat climate change. But this does seem to be further evidence, if we needed such evidence, that we are living through times where flooding and hot temperatures and other sort of uh, extreme weather events are going to dog us for, for, for more and more of our lives. Sienna, give us a more optimistic uh, slant on it. I think that when, you know, people more and more are seeing the reality of the climate crisis, I think people are willing to make sacrifices. But obviously there is that, that slogan in the climate movement, um, you know, Extinction Rebellion, the activist group, does have that slogan, tell the truth, which is a message to governments. And I don't think governments are telling the truth at the moment. And there's there's a lot of, you know, setting of very ambitious targets and not much substantive policy to actually bring them up. So we need to see that. OK, thank you. Um, let me take you to the front page of The Express. Rishi warned on ditching pension pledge. Uh, Tim, this is about the triple lock, which you'll remind us what that is. Yes, it's a, co a commitment that the Conservative Party has made in a number of recent manifestos. And it basically means that pensioners get a guaranteed increase in the basic state pension that's either consistent with uh, wages growth, um, the growth in prices, or I think a flat percentage. So it's meant really, it's helped to accelerate the huge um, improvement in pensioners' welfare in Britain. And up until sort of relatively recently, pensioners were worse off on average than people of working age. And measures like this, promises like this, have changed that. But because, you know, I oversimplify, but basically in Britain we have twice as many older people as younger people, they're twice as likely to vote. And so they're very hard to sort of break promises to. So politicians keep promising pensioners more and more for understandable reasons. But the people who are really losing out are people of working age. Poverty is now concentrated in those groups. And if we had a government that was sort of, or any political party that was more interested in doing what was right for uh, the fight against poverty rather than right politically, we'd be abandoning this uh, a pensions pledge and focusing resources on, on, on younger families who um, are still struggling to pay the household bills. Sienna, do you think this is a, uh, this is a pledge that should be broken? No, so we're going to disagree yet again, which at this one time is particularly ironic because obviously at 27, I'm not going to be benefiting from the triple log anytime soon. Um, but, you know, our state pension is, it's still not as generous as other countries that you could compare the UK to. Um, this is kind of regarded as, as a tricky one electorally, but also, I mean, it's seen often as this question of kind of intergenerational fairness. And that's what Tim was touching on, that, you know, older people are benefiting at the expense of younger people. We have a much worse situation in terms of our housing costs are spiralling out of control. We've got insecure work, et cetera, et cetera. I have, you know, completely support all of those arguments. But in the end, I think we've got to look to the the future and hopefully my generation will benefit from the triple lock eventually um so no i would not <laughs> i would not recommend um breaking this yeah i'm reaching the different conclusion <laughs> you've got a while to wait sienna i'll just jump in there um just finally can i take you both uh, back to the guardian williamson should go starmer tells pm so keir starmer's called on boris johnson to sack his education secretary gavin williamson um tim um not a great sort of history of the prime minister doing what the leader of the opposition says is there or of what I say, I was a Boris Johnson advisor, but left because he didn't take much of my advice either. So he's probably not going to take it now. But perhaps Sienna and I can end on a note of agreement, because I do think he's been about the most incompetent cabinet minister of recent times. So I agree with Keith Starmer and maybe um, I can agree with Sienna on this last issue as well. She's certainly nodding <laughs> vociferously. Sienna, 10 seconds to agree. 
Oddly enough, yes, I completely agree. I mean, he's been tipped for the sack. And uh, I mean, hopefully Keir Starmer calling for him to be sacked isn't going to put the prime minister off from actually doing it because he's been a terrible education secretary. I think everyone agrees with that. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you both very much indeed. Sienna Rogers, Tim Montgomery, really good to talk to you. Thanks so much. Well, that is, this, it, that is it for the papers this evening. Thank you again to Tom, to Tim and Sienna. Coming up next is The Sport and then Newsday at midnight. Goodbye.